Hello, uh, thank you for joining us today and taking the time out of your day to, to tune in um, and, and take a listen to, to what we have to say on, on a very, very important uh, issue. Um, my name is Alex Hausman. I am the Government Relations Director um, with Big Eye Michigan. Uh, joining us today is, is Wendy Block, uh, the Senior Vice President of Business a Advocacy uh, with the Michigan Chamber. So uh, we wanna discuss a high level um, high level discussion on the uh, Michigan Supreme Court ruling that came down recently on the pay leave um, and minimum wage increase. Um, so uh, without further ado, let's just dive into it, Wendy. Um, if you could just go into a little bit of detail on, on how did this come about um, and, and how did we get here? Yeah, so thanks for having me, number one. But uh, in terms of what happened, so the Michigan Supreme Court on July 31st issued its monumental decision on a case that is called Mothering Justice versus Attorney General. It's often referred to as the adopt and amend case. And really what the court did here is put into law two ballot proposals from 2018 that were never voted on by the people. Um, and there's been a lot of back and forth about this, but basically what happened is going back to 2018, two ballot proposals qualified to be put on the November ballot and under their constitutional power, the legislature decided to adopt those ballot proposals, never sending them to the people. Uh, at the time, they uh, acknowledged that there were very, very strong problems with the two ballot proposals. And so they said, under our constitutional power, we are going to subsequently amend those ballot proposals, which they did in December of 2018. Mm -hmm. And that's really what has been challenged in the courts ever since is not only not just the question of whether the legislature can adopt, which we know that they can. It's a question of when they can amend. And the Michigan Supreme Court said, no, 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 you can't amend until a subsequent legislative session. Now, we do not believe that this is supported by the words in the Constitution. We believe that this is pure judicial activism. Uh, but the problem is there's no more appeals here. We've kind of run, it's run its course. And so uh, these two ballot proposals will take effect in February, on February 21. And really the impact will be felt by job providers across Michigan, as well as workers in many situations. Yeah, and and so you touched on that. Um, I mean, how how broad is this, right? I mean, does it affect a certain industry, or or is it just, I mean, anybody that employs, you know, a certain amount of people, or? Yeah. So, um, you know, we're really talking about two issues here. We're talking mm -hmm. about the minimal wage uh, over time going to about fifteen dollars, then be being tied to the rate of inflation. We're talking about the full elimination of the tip minimum wage in Michigan. So all tipped employees now will make the minimum wage with their tips on top. That's very uh, going to be very devastating for the restaurant and hospitality industry. Uh, but as it relates to paid leave, which I think is what the majority of your listeners are probably tuning in to learn about, uh, it is a very wide ranging uh, act. And so there are no exemptions. If you have one or more employees, you will need to comply with the provisions of the what's known as the Earned Sick Time Act. Very catchy name there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it applies to all employees. So full-time employees, part-time employees, seasonal employees, temporary employees that will kind of come down to a contract issue, we believe, between uh, the, the employer and the, the temp agency. We believe it could be even interpreted to expand to apply to uh, independent contractors. There's still some big questions about that, things that the state will have to work through. We're hoping to see some legislative changes on that. And there's a big question about how this applies to out-of-state workers. If you're domiciled in Michigan, will this law extend to not only your in-state employees, but also your out-of-state employees and kind of more uh, to come on that as well? We really mm -hmm. don't know. And different employment law attorneys have different takes on the language as it relates to that out-of-state employee piece, as well as the independent contractor piece. Absolutely. And after the legislature uh, did 
adopt and amend, right? They, they were able to insert some uh, exemptions, right? Some critical exemptions. And, and yes. this time around, there are no exemptions. Yes. And so, I mean, that's a part of uh, what we're working on with Big Eye and others and a coalition format is to figure out how we might be able to amend the Earn Sick Time Act to make it more workable, looking at specific carve outs or exemptions for small businesses, for part-time employees, certainly for seasonal employees, kind of wanting to clarify that out-of-state employee piece and and some other things. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's likely that come February, uh, employers, you know, and depending on what mm -hmm. those exemptions end up looking like, will need to uh, allow employees, all employees, if it doesn't change, to accrue one hour of paid leave for every 30 hours worked up to 72 hours in a given year. And there's only a small change for paid and unpaid for those small employers with nine or less employees. Yeah, and, and you mentioned this too, that Big Eye Michigan, Michigan Chamber, amongst other, uh, you know, industry stakeholders are working, I mean, night and day on this issue to make some changes. Uh, but I want to touch on that because sometimes in Lansing and in D.C., um, when there's a major, major ruling or law change to this level, um, it, it helps to build a coalition, right? And it helps to, to, to compile all of our resources as industry stakeholders um, and, and hit different areas of the legislature that you know, we're, we're better at, right. I mean, in that, yeah. in that we are yeah. more comfortable, we have more relationships in. And so that's exactly what we did that we are doing here. Um, and we've built a coalition. So do you, will, will you kind of just go into that a little bit and, you know, who's in the coalition, what are we doing? Yeah. So uh, we have built a very broad coalition on this issue, as you might expect, right? Because this impacts everyone. It impacts everything from your parks and recs department and your local unit of government to churches and nonprofits to traditional businesses and business groups. Uh, so we have, uh, I think, just over 50 groups in our coalition at this point. It continues to grow. And really what the coalition is focused on as it relates to paid leave is how to make sure that implementation works for employers and employees alike. Uh, because the, the details here matter, right? On its mm -hmm. face, this is very populist, right? It, it sounds great. Like who doesn't think people need or should have sick time available? Nobody wants people going to work when they're sick. It's the details here that are really uh, what are troubling. And so, you know, we want to make sure as a coalition, you know, we're working that for legislation that says that uh, employers that have 72 hours or more that they offer that in one PTO bank or as a standalone mm -hmm. sick time bank, that they can be exempt from this, that they shouldn't have to deal with all the little micromanaging type mm -hmm. provisions of this act. We want to make sure that, you know, not everyone's plan is completely disrupted on February 21. We want to see exemptions for small businesses and for certain workers. We want to allow that time to be used in uh, half day increments, because what the act says is that you have to be able to use your time in the smallest increment that you use to track payroll. For some of our members, they may be tracking payroll in as little as one or six minute increments. So you start thinking about 72 hours a year and trying to figure out how you're going to let people use that increment in one or six minutes. It just doesn't make any sense. We, there are very strong uh, restrictions on advance notice in the Earned Sick Time Act. We want to have employers be able to have uh, their customary and usual notification procedures. Uh, and then, you know, we want to make sure that this, this, this Earned Sick Time Act doesn't just create this whole new class of lawsuits because there are extreme provisions in here, unlike any other state, as it relates to a rebuttable presumption for employees, it's kind of assumed that the employer is doing something wrong if they take discipline action against an employee after they've exercised their right to use earned sick time. And it also gives employees the right to not only go to the state when they have a complaint or they believe that they've been wronged, but it allows them go, to go straight to court through a plaintiff's attorney and to be incentivized by the recovery of reasonable attorney's fees and costs. And so that is a big problem as well. And then finally, we want to make sure that employers are able to front load all 72 hours at the start of a given year, whether that's a benefit year or a calendar year or an anniversary year, but then they avoid the carryover requirements that are included in the Earned Sick Time Act. So if you have that time available to you at the start of the year, there really is no reason to have to carry over 
that time as the act requires. So we're kind of focused on those big five things or some other smaller things as well. Uh, but the coalition has been spending the summer talking to legislators, educating them about uh, the Supreme Court's decision and uh, talking about why things need to change because the decisions that our employers are getting going to be forced to make come February are often going to end up hurting the very worker that is intending to help. And the big one is that it's going to force employers to really think uh, strongly about separating out that 72 hours of sick time from all of their vacation time. If you only have two hour, two weeks available to you today, like that is going to be a problem where the yep. first 72 goes into sick time. And maybe the only those eight hours now are available for personal time and vacation time. And that is not good for workers. Well, and absolutely. And, and the majority of our membership, right, we're small business owners. Um, it's going to be absolutely devastating for some of our for, for some of our agency principals. Um, and we're going to do we're, we are doing everything that we possibly can to, to make those adjustments. Um, and I know through the conversations that I've had um, with certain legislators, right, it's all it's all pretty positive feedback. Right. It's, I mean, it's, it's more or less a bipartisan issue. Um, and so moving on to the next next little uh, segment here. Um, you know, what I'm hearing is that the legislature, or at least the Michigan House of Representatives, they're not going to come really come back in the, in the session until after November, right, until after the general election. Um, so what's, what's the plausibility here? I mean, how, how realistic is it that we, that we actually get something moving and lame duck, um, you know, and, and will the governor sign it? Yeah, so um, it's a really good question. The timing here is not ideal. Um, definitely want to acknowledge that. Um, after the November election, we'll probably have one week of session, and then the legislature will go on its traditional two-week hunting break and then be back for lame duck. Uh, our goal is to get something done as quickly after the election as we can. Ideally, we'd be getting this done yet this fall. But as you mentioned, uh, the legislature is not really going to be in this fall uh, because it is the all 110 members of the Michigan House are up for re-election. And so it's a campaign year, right? So yeah. not a lot of session days here to play with, which is why it's important that we're doing this work this summer to educate lawmakers that we're getting um agreement around what sorts of key changes we think we can get across the finish line. And we're trying to be politically realistic about that, uh, about what we really can sell, because we need legislators on both the left and the right to come together to solve this issue. We believe that in both caucuses, you're going to have members that will hold out for different reasons, mm -hmm. obviously. And so we need, you know, kind of that common sense, pragmatic group to come together in the middle and to be committed to finding a solution. So, uh, again, timing is tight. We need to get this done yet in 2024. By the time we hit January, it will be the start of a new legislative session. It always takes several months for the legislature to get ramped up. And so our window will kind of be closed uh, by the end of this year. And so, um but we do believe that, you know, there is when there's a will, there's a way. And mm -hmm. there seems to be some interest in trying to tackle this issue. Uh, I think the governor's office is they don't are saying don't expect us to lead on this issue. Uh, but they also are not saying that they're opposed or not willing to sign th something if it hits her desk. Uh, and so, you know, we're really looking to legislators to to lead this issue and and to be helpful. And that's kind of where maybe your members come in on this, right? Uh, what we really need is surround sound in local communities, right? There's a lot that Alex and I and others can do in Lansing uh, in, you know, with legislators in their office or over Zoom. But really where the magic starts to happen is when someone like Alex talks to a legislator in Lansing about this issue, and then they hear about it at Rotary Club or mm -hmm. a local chamber meeting or at the grocery store or at church or other things. And it's, you know, a business person is actually talking and sharing their story on this and talking about how this will impact their business, their workers, their bottom line, whatever, right? So yep. it's kind of not about necessarily needing to be an expert on this. This is why you have lobbyists in Lansing working on your behalf, but where we really need your help is just, just kind of like for this to keep coming up in conversations. So legislators can be like, yeah, I'm hearing about this everywhere I go. I, I know I know we need to do something and count me in. Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, Big Eye Michigan members, along with the Michigan Chamber members, um, I mean, that's that's what we do best. Right. Our, I mean, our members love the grassroots. They're very involved. Um, and like like Wendy said, I mean, there's nothing that that hits more 
to home to a legislator than a constituent reaching out on, on an issue and in multiple, I mean, hundreds of constituents reaching out at the same time that weighs, that weighs uh, a ton, um, yes. you know, to the legislator. And, and I mean, we can, like Wendy said, we can advocate, um, you know, night and day here in Lansing, but when it comes directly from their constituents, directly from the people that elect them, um, that, that, I mean, that carries, that carries tremendous weight. So um, thank you again, Wendy. Uh, you are certainly a rock star on, on these issues. We really appreciate all of your work um, in, in taking the time out of your day to day to join us and, and just kind of give us a brief overview on what we're doing in here in Lansing and then what our members can do back home in the districts um, as well. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and then if you guys have any other questions to please don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out to me. You guys have my contact information. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions on, on where we're at, any updates or what, what the coalition is doing or how you guys can get involved back home. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Wendy. Um, and, and have a great day. Thanks for the invite.